Welcome to Glossy Baptist Church, and I'm glad you all could make it. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this day, and thank you that we got to come to church and learn more about you, God. And thank you for everything that you've done for us. Good morning. In Sunday school this morning, the youth, we were talking about things that made us uncomfortable. And several of us had uh, speaking in front of people. <laughs> so so this, is, this is a timely Sunday to be talking about that. But I am so excited to be up here this morning to give an update from the pastor search team. Uh, a lot has been going on, and so it's time to update you and let you know what that is. So I'm going to use my notes because I don't want to forget anything. So in early spring, Pastor Bob kicked us off with the training on all the things that we need to be looking at, thinking about, researching, and preparing for. In May, uh, our team started putting together the pastor profile, which was like our job description and what we were going to post online to get resumes. And the whole purpose of that was to identify what, what we thought the man that God chose for Gwathmi would look like and what his characteristics would be and what his qualifications would be. And that whole process took almost a month from start to finish. The completed profile was posted on the local Dover Association website, uh, on the state BGAV and SBCV websites, and on the national SBC website, and that was May 26 and 27. So we allowed eight weeks for resumes to be filtering in, uh, and in God's perfect timing, that church's 40 days of prayer effort that we had uh, kicked off and ended about two days before the end of our resume period. So we cast a pretty wide net, and we had 28 resumes returned, uh, one from India, one from London, and then the others were from kind of all over the United States. Um, we closed that resume period on July the 18th, and the team took about two weeks to review what we got back and to pray over those, and then we went to ask for God's guidance. So we met again, and in the month of August, we narrowed down that list to our top 10 candidates and listened to sermons and re-reviewed their resumes. After another week of prayer, we selected four candidates to move to the next step of the process. So the next step of the process was where um, we sent out a questionnaire that had in-depth questions that we wanted the candidate to answer as well as some questions for the candidate's wife. And the questionnaire had 92 questions on it, so it was, it was significant. <laughs> and that we gave them two weeks to complete that. So at the end of the two weeks, the team met again um, on August 30th and selected the man that we feel is God's man for Gwathmi. He has all the qualifications identified in the pastor profile, along with an obvious passion for Christ and for people. On September the 5th, we did an interview with him. It was four hours and 10 minutes, um, with him and his wife, actually. Um, and it was, we covered a lot of things that were new, and we followed up on some things from the questionnaire to kind of get to know who this person is. Um, and in addition to all of that, we got, in response to the questionnaire, 26 pages of an answers from him and six pages from his wife. So in total, 29, uh, sorry, 23 pages and six pages, 29 pages in all of, of answers. So at the end of the interview and the questionnaire review and all of that, uh, we ended the day over dinner and we had sort of a more relaxed, like, let us pepper you with questions period. And they, in a good natured fashion, answered those as well and then they had a lot of questions for us and so I feel like there was a really good exchange of information back and forth over that day. The team went, met once more a few days later and confirmed that we feel God's leading to have him come and preach a trial sermon for us. So I'm happy to report that our candidate is coming on October the 3rd. Uh, he'll get a look at General Assembly, participate in Sunday school, and then bring us the message that God lays on his heart. We'll follow that up with the luncheon provided by the social committee so you can get to know him and his family. Because he currently pastors a church, out of respect for him in that congregation, we won't be introducing him until then. But I can't tell you how excited we are to be at this step of our journey. It's been, um, it's been interesting. <laughs> so I encourage everyone to be here on Sunday, October the 3rd, to hear what he has to say. 
And in the days that follow that, be prayerful, like be deeply prayerful. There will be a special called business meeting on Sunday, October the 17th. So we already have our regularly scheduled quarterly business meeting that day. Um, we'll end that and then convene the special called meeting to vote on calling him to be our pastor. Uh, Cindy, do we have the sign-up sheet for lunch? Okay, so Cindy's done a sign-up sheet for the social to follow, so please sign up for that after church today or next week so we can get a good count. And please continue to be in prayer between now and then as we seek to follow God's will for our church. Thanks. Please stand.
may be seated. Good morning. Hope everybody's had a good week and is doing well. We do have those in our congregation who are going through sickness and other things that we need to continue to pray for, procedures, uh, family, emotional issues. Always be in prayer for your family in prayer. Father, bless us today. We are in your house. We are here to hear a word from you. But we've been here worshiping you. We want you to know how much we love you. And we thank you for you just being our God each and every day. And in spite of sometimes when we have a tendency to wander and go our own way, that you are always standing there ready to forgive and to minister and to restore. Your love is beyond imagination, and we thank you for it. So we pray that you'll give us your wisdom today, as any time we come to your word, it is what you have written, not what I have written or anybody else here, to understand it, we need your Holy Spirit. So give us your spirit and give him freedom to walk among each one of us and to speak to our hearts today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish instead from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa and found a ship which was going to Tarshish. And he paid the fare and he went down into the boat to go with them to Tarshish so he could leave from the presence of the Lord. Well, it says the captain approached him and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. We began looking at this prophet of God last week. The prophet had one job before God. He was to go wherever God wanted him to go to declare whatever God was giving him to declare. Prophets always began by speaking by saying this, Thus saith the Lord. It wasn't their idea. It wasn't their opinion. It wasn't their words. It was God's. We talked last week, how do you know the difference between a false prophet and a true prophet? And the fact is, false prophets might say some things that are true, but a lot of things that make no sense at all. I don't know if any of you remember somebody named Gene Dixon. How many of you remember D Gene Dixon? Every year in January 1st, she'd have her predictions for the year. And there were about four or five hundred of them, and maybe ten percent of them came true. That's a false prophet. 
Because when a true prophet speaks, whatever he says will be, will be. And Jonah was a true prophet of God. Because you see, when a prophet of God speaks, he can only speak truth. If he's speaking what God says and not giving his own opinion, he's speaking truth. Every preacher that ever is called by God to preach has the gift of prophecy, has to. Because you want someone, when they get up to preach on Sunday morning, not to be speaking of what they think or giving you their opinion. You want to hear from God. You want to know what God has to say, not what he has to say. And in order for that to happen, he must spend lots of time in prayer and lots of time in Bible study. In most churches I've been in, most people in the church believe the pastor only works on Sunday and Wednesday because that's all they see him. They don't realize all the time that he is spending preparing to make sure that when he begins to speak, he's not speaking from himself. He's speaking truth because it didn't come from him while he was studying God gives him the words to say. Every time I get finished with a message, I don't look at it and say, Bob, man, you are really smart today. You did a really good job this week. I just shake my head every week and say, God, wow, what a sermon. Because it speaks to me as much as it's going to speak to anybody else. He only tells what God tells him to tell. And here's the thing about old Jonah. He didn't have a long sermon to preach. It wasn't going to be 30 minutes or 20 minutes. Here's what God told Jonah to say. Yet 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. That's all he had to say as he walked through the country of Assyria and walked through the capital city, which was Nineveh. Yet 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Just had to say that over and over to anyone who could hear and would listen. What do we know about Jonah? Well, Jonah lived in the northern kingdom of Israel. You remember, the nation of Israel was divided into the northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah. He came from the north. And uh, in order to get to from where he was to Assyria, to Nineveh, he would have to travel east. But it tells us that he went down to the city of Joppa on the sea, and he found a boat and buys that ticket to that boat, which was heading to Tarshish. Tarshish was a city founded by the Phoenicians in the southern coast of Spain. It was the jumping off place of the West. It was the complete opposite way of Assyria. Well, we talked about the fact that one of the reasons that Jonah decided to run is because he could care less about the Ninevites. Uh, he would just assume that God would just go ahead and blast them, just get rid of them. Because the Jews and everybody else in the world hated the Assyrians. Hated the Assyrians. He didn't want them to be saved by God. And there was a basis for his hatred. 
Assyria was one of the most brutal nations of the ancient world. They were feared and dreaded by all the people. They used very cruel methods of torture, and I shared some of those last week. They found horrible ways to extract information from their captives. It was said that they were so feared and dreaded that if a town heard that they were coming to their town, the whole town would commit suicide rather than face the Assyrians. That's how dreaded they were. Nahum, the prophet, after he heard that God had brought his judgment and they were judged and destroyed, he, said, he once wrote this about God's judgment on them. He said, all who hear the news about you clap their hands at you. For who have not experienced your unremitting wickedness? When we try and imagine that today, it's pretty easy. Because we have seen really ugly, hateful things happen in our world today by little small nations in other parts of the world. 9-11, who could have ever imagined that they would come up with a plan like that? We hadn't. That's why we weren't even prepared for it. Couldn't even imagine that that could happen. And then what we've seen just recently in Afghanistan, the horrors that are going on there and some of the horrors that the women are already looking for uh, going on in that country. The fact is, it could have been just like Al-Qaeda. It could have been like going to Iraq, walking through Iraq, going to Iran and having being called by God to walk through the streets of Iran. It could be like uh, us today having to go to Afghanistan and walk through the country of Afghanistan and make a warning like this. He didn't think they deserved a warning, let alone uh, any chance for God's forgiveness in their lives. When I think about us as individuals, I have to ask that question. Have God ever asked us to do something for him that instead we have walked the opposite way and away from him. Churches are notorious when God begins to ask them to do something, will find themselves walking the other way, away from him and doing what they think is best instead of what God is asking them uh, to do. You notice when he gets to Joppa, he didn't have any trouble finding a ticket on a ship going the opposite way. It was so easy for him to flee. And so wouldn't you know that seeing that, he probably felt like, you see, I'm right. This is really so easy. It must be the will of God. Because a lot of times Christians do that. If everything's easy as pie, we just assume right away, well, it must be the Lord's will. If we ever face struggles, it must not be the Lord's will. And so much we base our decisions on how easy or how difficult it is. Well, that might work if it wasn't for the fact that we have an adversary. And his name is Satan. Satan is always trying to look like, talk like, be like God. To get us to choose to go the way he wants to, thinking that we're doing God's will, when in reality we're doing his will. And instead of doing the works of God, we're thwarting or going against the works of God. Paul said it this way. He said, we have struggles that are against powers in unseen places. 
Paul didn't have an easy life that would have said to him, God's in every decision you're making because look how easy it was. It was just the opposite. His life was miserable. He spent most of his Christian life in cold, dark dungeons with little food, cold, hot, little comfort, thinking, horrible places. Most of his Christian life was spent there. And he went, 2 Corinthians tells us about all the things he faced, crashes in boats, being in the sea for days with no help, times when he was beaten, left for dead. Paul didn't go through easy times to say, well, I know this is God's will for me. So in verse 4 and 5, it tells us this. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. And there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. That hard of a storm. And the sailors became afraid. Every man cried out to his God. And they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. So that they could just let the storm take the ship instead of the ship banging against the storm. But Jonah, he was nowhere to be found. Because he had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. Now, there are a few things I want you to notice about these verses. First, Jonah's disobedience threatened the whole crew. Notice that first. Jonah, because he was disobedient to God, was threatening every passenger on this boat. In fact, is any time a Christian goes the opposite way. Anytime a Christian runs from God, it doesn't just hurt that Christian. It hurts everybody around them too. Many a family has been destroyed because a mother decided to go her own way or a father especially decides to go his own way. There's a scripture that says the sins of a father are visited upon him to the third and fourth generation. It doesn't just affect the people around him, but it's going to affect the people that come after him. What he does to his sons and daughters is going to affect your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to the third and fourth generation are going to suffer because of what a man decides to do in his own life. Boy, we see that in our world today, especially in America, with all kinds of things that can get the attention of men. Pornography is one of the biggest problems for men that takes us away and begins to walk us in a road that God does not want us to walk, not realizing what we do to our wives and our kids. They, I've had people say, they don't know what I do. Yes, they do. They may not know exactly what you're doing, but they know something is missing. I had a young man I was talking with one day, and he was telling me, his wife was divorcing him, and he couldn't understand why. She also was getting some physical enhancements done, and he couldn't understand why, and he talked about it, and he was crying about it. And I was trying to comfort him and strengthen him, and all of a sudden he said, Bob, by the way, I'm heavy into pornography. And I went, what? He said, I'm heavy in it, uh, not on the internet. 
I go to those places, those rooms, those houses where you go into a back room and I said, let me ask you something. Don't you think that that is contributing to why you're going through what you're going through now? Oh, no, Bob. She doesn't know anything about that part of my life. Well, she may not know exactly what you're doing, but every time you look at her and she sees the disappointment in your eyes, she knows that something is missing in her relationship with you. Alcohol, drugs, destroys families, destroys them for generations. I used to walk, uh, work on a detox unit and see people come through trying to get off of alcohol and drugs. And at least 70-80% of the people that go through a rehab and get off alcohol and drugs are back on it within a year. And they may go through detox three, four, five, six times before they ever break free, if they break free of it at all. And it heavily uh, affects their family. Their families become codependent because they try and help cover it up and they have to lie in order, well, why did dad act that? Well, they come up with other excuses and they're fighting for their dad when he's making all of their lives miserable. And I say dad and it happens with mothers too. Alcohol is a drug. It's the worst drug. Do you know it's harder to break, to get off alcohol than it is to get off cocaine? Do you know that? Because you can go cold turkey with cocaine, but you can't with alcohol because you face DTs, which can kill you. The fact is, alcohol is the worst drug in our nation today. And a child of an alcoholic has such a much higher uh, uh, possibility of becoming an alcoholic one day when they grow up. In fact, they say the first time the child of an alcoholic drinks, they are an alcoholic already. And it costs for generations. It hurts. So what we do doesn't just affect us. It affects everybody around us. Everybody hurts because of the decisions that we make and follow through. And that was true with Jonah. They weren't running from God, but they were being punished for his running from God. And it was going to cost them their lives. I say to men, we need to be instead spiritual leaders of our home. We're supposed to set the tone. Our wives and children need to find protection under us. They need to buy, find comfort with us. We, we need to lead our families, our wives and our children, in the word of God and in prayer and in following God in our lives. Well, where was Jonah in verse 5? It says Jonah was asleep. The storm is going. It is vicious. These professional sailors who knew how to face storms, they had faced them so many times before, but they reached a point where they realized that whatever they were doing was not going to work they were going to die. So they were terrified, and they were fighting for their lives. But Jonah was having the best sleep he had ever had in his life. So in verse 6, these pagan sailors experienced at sea. The fact is, they began to cry out, it says, to their gods, 
And you got to understand, there were a lot of gods they were praying to because these men were from all over the world and they each had their own gods. And what it says is their gods weren't listening to them. Oh, really? Because they were getting no help at all. Why? Because their gods had no ears to hear or no power to do anything. In fact, the only person on board who had a god who could make a difference in this situation was Jehovah, Jonah's God. He was the only God to pray to that could make a difference. So they come to Jonah and they're pouring sweat and they're, they're so out of breath and they're just weary from fighting the storm. And how is it that you're sleeping? How could you be sleeping in this we're going through and he wakes up out of this deep sleep and he's thinking what's creaky where is all that wind coming from and he puts his feet on the floor and there are two foot of water on the floor and he goes what the ship is rocking and they said to him help us out now here's what he didn't say come help us bail the ship that they had tried that it wasn't working they said, get up and call on your God. We have called. Our gods are not answering us. How about that? Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Well, after he has this rude awakening wakes up to say what storm the question is this did Jonah pray to his God he did not why because he knew what he was doing he knew this storm was because of him he just didn't feel worthy even try and pray to God. You ever feel like that? I would like to go to God and confess my sin, but what I've done, there's no way God could forgive me. And I want you to hear me. That's baloney. I don't know why I said it that way. Our God is a loving, forgiving, restoring God. Every time. You say, but I just committed the sin. He couldn't, he's got to be mad at me today because when I did things wrong at home with my parents, their anger towards me went on for weeks. God's still got to be mad at me. You know why God gets mad at us? Because he knows that what we choose to do is going to bring consequences in our life that he doesn't want us to go through. And he hurts for us because it's going to take away from our fellowship with him and him being able to bless our lives the way he wants to bless our lives. He doesn't get mad at us because you did that to me. He gets hurt by the fact that we've just hurt ourselves before him. And he has so much to bless our lives with, and we give it all up for something that I want just today. You mean the next day I can say, God, I'm sorry? Yeah, if you mean it. Too often the next day when we say we're sorry is the ship is about to break up. It's only because we're starting to see the consequences and we don't like what we see. And so they woke him up and asked him to pray. He didn't pray. 
So in verse 7 it said, Each man said to his mate, Come let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. They knew somebody's God was angry with them. They knew that. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Well, what would you know? So they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? They wanted to know everything about him. What people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I am a Jew. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry man uh, land. Well, the men then were really frightened. And they said, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. I'm running from my God. How could you do that? Because you see, when Jonah saw the storm, he recognized God in it. So in verse 11 and 12, it says, So they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was getting even worse. The storm was even worse. It was already breaking up the ship. It's even worse. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me in the sea, and the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. Well, you say, well, Jonah finally took the high road because he knew the storm was because of him. His rebellion, his sin. There was no reason for all these other men to die because of him and his rebellion. But notice what he does. He doesn't say to them, open the door and I'm going to go jump in the sea. You'll be fine. He says instead to them, you guys pick me up and throw me in. <laughs> I want to say, Jonah, just go jump in. Why are you dumping this on them? They had nothing to do with it. And uh, so often we want to do the same thing in our own lives. Put it on others instead of ourselves. Brings up a question. When you're suffering in a response to your own sins, is it always because of your own sins that you suffer? No, we already talked about that. Paul suffered a lot, not because of his sin, but because of the obedience. But sometimes we do sin. And judgment and discipline of God comes to our lives. In the same way for churches that make decisions that bring the discipline of God into their lives. That's why the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 5 says, You have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God's going to deal with you as with sons. For what son is there that his father does not discipline? But if you find yourself being able to go your own way and never face discipline, of which all have become partakers, then what it warns you is you are an illegitimate son, or in other words, you're not really saved at all. If you're a Christian, you will always eventually run into the discipline of the Lord in your life. 
If you don't, it tells you something. Something's missing in my life. He goes on to say, Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline them, and we respected them. How much more, rather, should we be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For the discipline, us, he disciplines us for a short time, as seen, fathers do it for a short time, is seen best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. Here's the great thing about God's discipline. Sometimes the parents, would anybody admit, don't raise your hand, I'm just, this is redundant. Would anybody say you ever disciplined your child harder than you, he really or she really deserves? (laughs) You know the great thing about God's discipline? It is only ever exactly what he needs to do to get your attention. He never over disciplines. He is so careful to only do what he needs to do. Our father uh, disciplines for our good so that we, the father disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. Amen. But Sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And when a child of God who has been wandering faces the discipline of God and comes back to God, man, does that bring peace back into their life again. There are thousands of churches in our land and in our world that are living in the disciplining judgment of God and don't even know it. Not easy, by the way, going through the discipline of God. It hurts. It hurts. Verse 13. However, instead of throwing him overboard, what? The men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier. So finally they called on the Lord. What Lord? Jonah's Lord. Wow. We earnestly pray, O Lord, don't let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not put innocent blood on us, for you, Lord, have done just as you have pleased. They recognize the Hebrew God, the God of the seas and the land. Isn't that something? (coughs) Even though he said, throw me in the sea and everything will be fine, they didn't want to do it. They did everything they could to try and get it some other way. But when I think about that, I think, isn't that always the way for mankind? We always try and solve our problems doing it in our own strength and power. The last person we go to when we're in trouble is God. And I have found sometimes we'll go to get counsel from people at work and people at school and friends and neighbors People who aren't even saved, and finally, when we don't get any answers, we go, oh, yeah, God, I need help. Mankind always wants to solve it. That's what hedonism is. Leave man alone, and he will solve all of his problems himself. Yeah, how's that working for us in our world? We have the right telethons and the right charity concerts or the right colored ribbons. Uh, If we can involve the right right clubs, we can work this out eventually on our own. And even churches are notorious for saying 
that they believe in a supernatural God and yet do what they do only in their own strength and power. Have you ever noticed that? Question. How does a church ever bring glory to a supernatural God by doing things in their own strength and power? How could they ever glorify God by doing that? And I found this, even when a church goes to God and says, God, will you help me? Usually here's what they say. God, we are calling on your name. And let me tell you, God, how you can do it. You know, if you would just do this and line this up with this and this, look how that works out. Doesn't that look good? It's a good plan for you, God. Just do it the way that I see it. You know, if I win the lottery, that's going to solve all those problems. And if this happens, we want to tell God how to do our thing. And so he says, oh, let me write that down. Okay, let's do that way. Is that what he does? When God answers prayer, what does he do? He always does it completely opposite and differently than we could ever imagine. He comes in back door and amazes us with his presence and power in such a way that once he has done it, we look at it and we go, wow! I could have never thought of that. Whoa! That was God. You think about it. When was the last time at Guasme Baptist Church something happened that once it happened, you just went, whoa! How in the world did that come about? And you begin to just shake your heads with each other. Did you see, wouldn't it be something to come to a worship service one day and have the Holy Spirit so move in the midst of the congregation that everybody walked out in the parking lot and didn't start talking about school and everything else in their life, but said, did you see what God did this morning in our church? Did you see that? Why does God do it that way? Because he loves to show off. No. Because when God's ready to do a miracle, he does it his way so that nobody else will ever say, that was me. When God's finished working, no one can say, everybody's just going, whoa, what was that? Wouldn't that be exciting? Did you sense God's presence this morning? Yeah. He was in our service this morning. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. The fact is, if man could solve his own problems, it would throw dirt in the face of God and it would scoff at the cross of Jesus. My Bible says the only hope must be born again if you want to be saved. No, I can find it in my own power. I'm working out my... No, must be born again. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. I was sinking... But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. From those waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, right? Love lifted me, love lifted me. 
when nothing else could help God's love lifted me. What's so sad is there's so many believers who are trying to live their Christian life in their own strength and power, and they miss seeing the Red Sea part before them. They miss seeing the miracles that God is going to do in front of them, where they just have to praise God alone. Churches do that too. Jesus said this, Apart from me, you can do absolutely nothing. But with me, all things are possible. All things. You see, the only God that was able to heal this ship on that day was Jonah's God. And isn't it something that the sailors prayed to his God, not Jonah? We ever get the fact that understand that we have the very presence of God living inside of us, and we need to be living in that powerful presence of God every day. That's what will change the world. That's what will bring people to your life to know what you have going on that they're missing in their life. So Jonah doesn't cry out to his God. So finally in verse 15, they picked up Jonah. And I think, Jonah, why didn't you just jump? They picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and I want you to watch this. The minute that Jonah's toe <laughs> hit the water, the sea stopped raging. And then the men feared God. And they offered a sacrifice to Jonah's God and made vows to the God of Jonah. The minute his foot touched the water, the sea was raging and it just went. And they were looking at it and it was just like glass. Unbelievable. And as Jonah hits the water too, he realizes something. You know what that something is? He was about to die. Because he knew there were no other ships to rescue him. He knew there was nobody else in that water to rescue him. He hit that water and he knew this is it. I'm about to die. And he was right. Sharks probably would have got him pretty quickly. Except next week. Read you. Father, we're so thankful that you are a God of miracles. And that you choose and want desperately, desperately to work miracles in our life each and every day. You did every day of this week. There were miracles that took place. If we had enough food to eat this week, that was a miracle that came from you. That's why we have a blessing before a meal. Because the Bible says, all good things come from the Lord. And I had a lot of good things happen this week. And every one of them came from you. 
And I thank you for them. And I praise you for them. And I want everybody to know what you did in my life this week because it was miraculous to watch. In fact, each day we could see things where you were at work in our life, sometimes protecting us from a, a wreck that we could have had. Your protective hand was watching over us when coronavirus could have hit us. There are so many ways that you are at work that we don't even realize every day because we serve a supernatural God we could just get that through our head who wants to do supernatural works in and through our lives we need to catch that vision father so we pray that even this week we would do that live in your supernatural power and look around us every day and recognize where you are at work. And every time we see it, stop and say, thank you, God, for that. Wow, that was you in my life today. Be in this invitation. There may be somebody here today that needs to get saved. That would be glorious. All heaven would break out in celebration maybe some christians here today be honest enough say uh, bob i don't live in the supernatural power of god i do everything in my own strength and power and then i try to sign god's name off at the end of the week as though he were involved when i have no idea where he was involved because i wasn't even looking for Maybe they need to come to the deacon or to these kneeling benches and just pray to you and say, Lord God, forgive me for trying to live in the power of my own instead of living in your power every day. Forgive me for that. I repent of that before you today. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm going to ask our deacons to come forward and our song leaders and to lead us in a time of invitation. And I invite you to come right now. Let's stand together as we sing.
thank you this morning for being here. I hope uh, as you leave, you'll greet one another and just tell the person you're the best thing I've seen all week, okay? <laughs> Father, I just pray that you go with us this week in all that we do. And Father, here's what I am uh, have proof of and I know will happen. Every one of us is going to cross the path with, of someone who not only is lost, but right now they are searching for some meaning in their life. And if somebody would just stop and tell them about Jesus, they would open their heart to you even this week. Help us to be faithful and diligent, to be the witnesses you call us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're the best one. Thank you. You're the best thing I've seen. <laughs>